In for Emily Chang, this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, Trump veto. The president vetoes the annual defense policy bill in part, saying it must abolish the tech liability shield known as Section 230. The bill now goes back to Congress, where lawmakers must decide whether to override that veto. We'll have the latest. Plus, Uber's top lawyer. We'll hear from Tony West on the aftermath of Prop 22. Plus, whether Uber drivers qualify as essential workers in line for the COVID-19 vaccine before the general public. And flying, security cameras, souped up speakers and AI. We'll get a read on the big consumer technologies expected to make a splash in 2021. These stories in moments, but first, U.S. stocks broke a three-day losing streak even as uncertainty surrounded President Trump's demand for changes to pandemic relief legislation. Let's get the latest from Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle. And Abigail, President Trump obviously vetoing this legislation and that's making a difference to anemic markets. It is, although you never, never a dull day because so many headlines, including that one on President Trump, into the close, but overnight as well, saying that he may want changes to the stimulus bill. Markets looking past that, and I would argue Bonnie, that markets largely look past these later headlines with President Trump as well, because they came out right around quarter after three. Uh, stocks didn't do all that much, but then into the close, a little bit of a leg lower. So it's unclear as to whether or not it has to do with President Trump vetoing that military bill, uh, you know, the uncertainty around that, or if it's just some investors taking some profits um, off the table into the close. Either way, a little bit of a mixed close here. The S&P 500 up slightly. The first up day in four, though, the Nasdaq down pretty solidly, actually. That Nasdaq 100 down half a percent. And that really speaks to this year's, uh, and I should say more so, for the fourth quarter's reflationary and reopening trade with the Russell 2000 hitting a new time, new all-time high. Of course, tech this year, still hard for me to get my mind around this, but defense. So that was what was sold off. On the other hand, you have the banks and the energy really leading. And if we take a look at some of the movers on the day, we will see that because J.P. Morgan was the top stock for the S&P 500. Then we have Marathon Oil up 7.9 percent. Those were the top sectors. On the other hand, tech was the worst sector, down almost 1 percent. Microsoft, one of the big drags there, down 1.3 percent. Then a true stay-at-home stock, not actually a technology stock, but a uh, telecom services stock, Netflix, uh, down 2.4 percent. So again, you have investors going toward reflation, going away from safety and technology. Speaking of Tesla and electric vehicles and Nikola, some action there. Tesla had its first update in three after being added to the S&P 500. Folks getting past that idea of sell the news. Nikola, rough stretch here, Vani. They lost a contract for electric dump trucks. Investors dumping the stock. Well, we are going to continue speaking about vehicles, electric vehicles, and more. Abigail Doolittle, thank you for that. Back to President Trump's veto of the defense spending bill. Part of that decision comes from his demand that Section 230 of the 1996 Communications Decency Act be repealed. This, of course, is a legal shield used by many tech companies. With more on that, as well as, of course, the big EV story this week and Elon Musk pursuing preliminary outreach to Apple to buy Tesla is Wedbush Securities analyst Dan Ives. Dan, let's start right there because we had the announcement this week in the pop for Apple once it began speaking about the car that's coming, right, even though it's several years down the road and then we had Elon Musk replying to a tweet about Apple's batteries and what might actually happen. You say that, in fact, a partnership between the two might still be possible. Yeah, my opinion for Apple to dive into the deep end of the pool on EVs, it's likely through a partnership or collaboration. I view Tesla, VW as two top candidates. And you, know, you take a step back, this is a trillion-dollar market the next decade in terms of EV. So it's something where Apple is not going to be on the outside looking in. They are going to, you know, I believe, get into EVs. I just don't see them producing their own automobiles over the coming years. I think initially it starts with a partnership, and I view Apple Tesla as really the perfect match. So how did you view Elon Musk's response to a tweet saying that he had actually approached Tim Cook, who hadn't even taken a meeting when Tesla was a tenth the price that it is now? I think Musk, Tesla, it was a different story. I and mean, when you go back to 2013, 2014, rather who Tesla is in 2021. And 
No, and, and I do believe in terms of for Apple, they got to pick the right partner and collaboration. And obviously Tesla right now in terms of the EV market, it's Tesla's world and everyone else is paying rent. But it's only 3% of overall automobiles today, going to 10% 2025. That's why right now you're going to see every major tech player try to get a piece of this EV pie. It's similar to what we see with Baidu doing in China, where I see them going after a strategic partnership going after EVs in China. Now, Dan, how much difference did it make to the stock to be included in the S&P 500 in the medium term? Does it hold on to these gains that it's made? Yeah, I view this week as a sell in the news, not necessarily the start of a negative trend. Look, it's important. It, it, it's a feather in the cap for Musk in terms of profitability in the red ink in the rear view mirror. And really, I think legitimizes what Tesla has done, not just from growth, but from profitability. And I think going forward, in terms of what we see in EVs, especially as they go after demand more and more in China, you know, I think S&P, it takes out a question mark out of the name. You, know, you go back to early September, that was a head scratch when they didn't get into S&P 500. You saw the parabolic run over the last, you know, called 30, 45 days. I view this as selling the news, and I still view it $1,000 bull case on Tesla. A $1,000 bull case still. Dan, back to Apple, because obviously we got the EV story this week, and, and some analysts and investors are saying, look, this is a 2025 or later story. Some, including yourself, are saying it could be a lot sooner. But you also have a general top 10 Christmas list for Apple investors. It does include the EV, but just give us one or two more Christmas wishes. Yeah, I mean, for our Christmas wish list, at first it's the super cycle, and that really... You know, about iPhone 12, 5G, we believe it's a real super cycle. And they could be at 240, 250 million units. That would be a record surpassing iPhone 6. That's really the first wish list because that's key to the stock. And when you look at products, I do think in 2021 they finally unveil Apple glasses. That's the AR technology that will be embedded in the glass. I think they announced that potentially at a worldwide developer conference in 2021 and overall that combined with services i think a year from now this is north of 160 dollar potentially 200 dollar stock that's our bull case and once again you maintain that we could see an apple car when dan actually on the streets i believe on the streets 2023 potentially 2024 but i believe a partnership laying the groundwork for that we see that over the next year in terms of that strategic collaboration. Now, Dan, I want to mention Section 230 and get your thoughts on where you think this fight might go. President Trump obviously vetoing the defense spending bill. He wanted to attach to the defense measure uh, uh, that provision to eliminate Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Now, that particular measure protects tech companies from liability for most content published by their users. Does that happen? I don't think it happens now, but it does speak to just more and more pressure around 230 going to be a UFC battle in the beltway around this. And, you know, I think if you look, investors are viewing this as a contained risk, but it speaks to just this broader topic where we're going to see big tech versus the beltway. And, you know, even with the Biden administration coming in, that's going to be a theme, you know, not just on potential breakup or just overall pressures, but you're seeing a lot of these tech giants, they're going to be spending a lot of time in the 202 area code, even if it's virtually. Even if it doesn't happen this time, we have the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, Jim Inhofe, saying that President Trump's complaints about tech liability could be addressed in different legislation. I mean, we don't know what the result of the, of the Georgia runoffs will be, but, for example, if Republicans have more power, is it possible that it comes up soon within the first 100 days of a Biden administration? Oh, I think in the first 100 days, this is going to be a big topic because, you know, as we're seeing, not just from a tech perspective, but just from a consumer perspective, it's, it's something that's becoming more and more of a debate. And 230 continues to, to be, you know, a major battleground. I think social media companies are, you know, watching this with the close eye investors are watching this, you know, especially as this is, I think, just the first step of a broader battle that we see between big tech and the ballet and also in the EU, which to some extent even has some sharper teeth when it comes to regulation. 
Yes, indeed. Margareta Vestiger is getting a little uh, antsy again as well. She is definitely going to make 2021 a year to remember. So, Dan, if you had to guess, when do you think it might become you know, difficult for the tech companies once again in D.C.? They've had a couple of months to take a breather. Yeah, I think as we start to get, you know, especially with new Congress, you know, regulation is going to be more and more focused. Of course, you have the DOJ suit, which will make its way through court. And I think the big question is, is, is it fines or business model tweaks or changes? I can tell you the one thing that has a real impact even today is these tech companies, the larger, the FANG, they really cannot make acquisitions today. And, and I think, you know, they continue to be hamstrung with a, a closer eye in terms of their business model changes. And I think that's something that companies like Microsoft could take advantage of it because they're not necessarily handcuffed when it comes to any sort of beltway pressure. And I could see Microsoft getting a lot more aggressive going after some of the traditional fang names like Amazon as well as Google. Dan, always a pleasure. Very educational speaking with you, and thank you, Dan Ives of Wedbush Securities. Thanks for joining. Coming up, Prop 22 was a win for Uber, but there are still traffic jams to maneuver for the company. Next, we'll discuss what legal issues are threatening the company's operating license. This is Bloomberg. The gig economy struck a win in November when California passed Prop 22, the law allowing companies such as Uber, DoorDash, Lyft to continue classifying their workers as independent contractors. Now, while this looked like a win for Uber, the company isn't out of the woods yet. The state of California is now requesting the ride-hailing company to turn over information on witnesses to alleged incidents of sexual harassment and assault or risk losing their operating license. Joining me now to discuss is Uber's chief legal officer, Tony West. And Tony, thank you very much for joining Bloomberg Technology this evening. Tony, thank you, Bonnie. Why isn't it easier for Uber to just comply with all of these state regulations and state laws? Why fight this when it costs money, it costs time, and ultimately you may have to hand over all this information anyway? Well, you know, actually we, we do comply and we do hand over uh, information every year. Um, it's really easy to kind of simplify this issue as Uber against a regulator or a regulation. It's about much more than that, Bonnie. It's about protecting survivors' right to consent and the right to privacy. And it's also about not discouraging other companies from taking voluntary steps to be more transparent about the safety of their platforms and practices. Uh, because it's really only by being more transparent uh, and voluntarily so like Uber has been uh, and having hard conversations about things like sexual violence that you can actually make a difference and, and make, make the platform safer. So this is not about uh, not wanting to turn over information. This is about turning over information, but doing it in a way that protects survivors of sexual violence. Well, speaking of protection, California's Coronavirus Advisory Council met this afternoon to try to figure out a timeline for who should get the virus when and so on. What is Uber doing to advocate for its workers as emergency workers, for example, and, and when will they be in line? Well, you know, the three great thing, one of the great things about the Uber platform is that uh, it can be used to encourage the widespread adoption of the COVID-19 vaccine. You know, it's something that we've been advocating uh, for a while now that drivers and couriers who've been on the front lines, we've wanted them to be able to receive some kind of priority so that they and their families can be protected. And we were pleased to see over the weekend that the CDC recommended that, that drivers and couriers uh, be treated as essential workers and have access to the vaccine behind healthcare workers and elderly individuals. Uh, the other thing that we're doing is we've committed 10 million free or discounted rides to help ensure that transportation is not a barrier to anyone, you know, getting the vaccine. We're, we're kicking off this effort in partnership with the National Urban League, the Morehouse School of Medicine, the National Action Network. These are organizations with deep, deep ties in communities of color, which, as you know, Vani, have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Uh, and so we're, we're pleased to be a part of not only the economic recovery story, but we want to be part of the health recovery story as well. And that's a phenomenal effort. But just for your employees, you mentioned the CDC had recommended that these be classified as essential workers. But have you advocated 
in any part on behalf of your own employees and do you have any answers from California as to when they might expect to get vaccinated? Well, again, just to clarify, it's it's for the not employees, but for drivers and couriers, the, the the hundreds of thousands of drivers and couriers who are on the platform. We were advocating for them uh, to to be treated as essential workers. Uh, we believe, in terms of anybody else, we ought to wait in line and wait our turn to get the vaccine. Um, but if you are on the front lines, serving communities as drivers have been doing on the front lines, delivering food as couriers have been doing. Um, we think that that kind of heroic effort uh, ought to put you uh, in a priority category. And as I said, uh, the CDC has recommended that those drivers and couriers be treated as essential workers uh, and have access to the vaccine behind healthcare workers and elderly individuals. How many coronavirus tests have you been providing to your drivers and couriers, as you say, and, and how much have you spent on that effort? Well, we, we spent an awful lot of money on the COVID response. You know, we were one of the first companies to step up uh, as soon, back in March, as soon as it was clear that this pandemic um, was something that was widespread, to make sure that uh, drivers and couriers on the platform had easy access to telehealth services, to be able to get uh, COVID tests easily. Uh, we wanted to make sure that they had PPE, personal protective equipment, uh, so that they could continue to do their job and earn at a time when there was widespread unemployment, people were being laid off. Uh, earners on the platform were able to continue to, to earn critical, crucial dollars uh, to survive, uh, and, in part because we were providing free of charge this personal protective equipment. You may have seen it. I don't know if you've been in an Uber lately, uh, but you may see that the, you know, the plastic barrier, uh, the we had a, a, exclusive, uh, a very good partnership with, with Clorox to provide uh, sanitary wipes, uh, gloves, uh, things that would not only make sure that riders felt safe whenever they trusted themselves to an Uber, but that drivers felt safe continuing to work on the platform. Do you have a dollar amount that you can share with us, Tony, as to what that might have cost? Uh, you know, I, I haven't, I, I'm not going to share it here. I mean, I, I, it is part of the, the, the disclosure I'm sure that, uh, that we will make when we announce our quarterly earnings. Now, what are your plans for the next California legislative session? You, I imagine, are thrilled that Prop 22 is out of the way for now. What is next? Well, look, you know, Prop 22 isn't the end. It's the beginning. It's the beginning of a conversation about how we can improve and up-level the quality of independent work. One of the things that was absolutely clear in this election is that independent workers said, we reject the status quo. We don't believe that we have to choose between the independence and flexibility that working on a platform like Uber or other platforms provides, make a choice between doing that and the benefits and security that one can get out of traditional employment. They ought to be able to have both. This is the 21st century. We ought to be able to provide both. And so that has been the aim uh, of, of this whole conversation. Prop 22 is, is, was one of the important milestones in that conversation where voters really heard the voices of earners um, on the platform, of drivers and couriers on the platform saying, we want to choose independence, but we want that independence to come with benefits, with minimum earning guarantees. And that is what uh, that is what happened, and uh, we're looking forward to doing even more to really enhance the quality of independent work. Tony, I do have to ask you, just on a personal note, uh, you have a, a little bit of a relationship, let's say, with the <laughs> White House, the administration incoming, and uh, there's a couple of positions still to be filled, including, I don't know, Attorney General. Have you had any conversations? <laughs> uh, no, I've not had any conversations uh, at all about, uh, about that. And uh, look, I'll tell you this. Um, all the speculation is, is, is definitely flattering, um, but the reality, and it's flattering because I love the Department of Justice. I spent half my career there, so obviously, I, you know, and I have a great deal of respect for the men and women who, who are career attorneys there. Um, but the reality is, is that uh, President Biden, uh, I completely have every confidence that President-elect Biden will be able to make the right decision, not only about that position, but as we've seen through the other cabinet positions that he has filled, he has made the right decision, not only for those departments, but also for the country. And, and I believe that will continue. 
Well, Tony, we will keep an eye out for any announcements uh, now or in the future. <laughs> Tony West, thank you for joining us. Tony West is Chief Legal Officer at Uber. Coming up, an all new edition of Power Up, where we're taking a look at the top tech trends and products to watch in the next year. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Mark Gurman with Bloomberg Technology, and on this week's Power Up, I'm looking at what to expect in tech in 2021. Despite the difficulties of 2020, it was a huge year for gadgets, with Apple, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Sony, and others popping out some of the most popular products to date. But 2021 is sure to be another strong year for the industry. Virtual and augmented reality products are sure to take another leap with Apple planning to announce its first mixed VR and AR headset as early as the end of 2021. Apple will look to integrate sci-fi level VR communications like Zoom on steroids and immersive gaming on its first headset, a precursor to a future pair of AR glasses. Apple is also developing several new Macs for next year, including a new iMac and MacBook Pro with its own custom chips that are designed to outpace the highest end parts from Intel a new Apple TV, an iPad Pro with a new chip, and iPhones that potentially integrate an in-screen fingerprint sensor are also in the cards. Google will likely fully integrate Fitbit into the company next year, so one could also expect upgrades on the smartwatch side of the industry. Look for the Alphabet company to also drive a bunch of new AI features and to continue its trend of pushing down the price of its Pixel phones, a strategy that has proved popular in recent months. Microsoft is also preparing new Surface tablets and laptops, but the company needs to decide how it can turn its Surface Duo foldable tablet phone combo into a winning product. So far, reviews have been poor for the device, but perhaps Microsoft has plans to turn that around in the new year. Amazon's home security drone is launching in the coming months too, and it surely is also working to figure out more places it could jam Alexa into people's lives following up on a strong year of new Echo speakers in 2020. Besides consumer gadgets, you can bet on bigger pushes across the tech landscape in artificial intelligence, machine learning, 5G connectivity, and autonomous driving. Given the pandemic's ongoing impact well into the new year, expect communication tools like Zoom to grow with even more new features and other companies stepping up to take on work from home technologies. I'm Mark Ehrman, this is Power Up. Technology. I'm Bonnie Quinn in New York, filling in for Emily Chang. From swords to bullets to satellite-driven missiles, the way countries attack each other has evolved over thousands of years, with the latest weapon being computers. The broad, sophisticated and damaging hacking campaign that U.S. officials are blaming on Russia has alarmed security firms and sent shockwaves through the United States government and private sector. But much still remains unclear. Joining me now for more insight is Kirsten Tote, Managing Director at the Cyber Readiness Centre. Kirsten, how concerned are you that beyond being cyber ready, we're not at all cyber ready? In fact, many, many private and public you know, agencies and companies have been hacked on, and continue to be at risk from this. Well, this attack is certainly concerning, and we're still in the discovery phase of understanding what has happened. But what we know is that it's far-reaching. Uh, I think recently we heard somebody talk about the blast radius of this attack being far worse than anything that we've seen a senior uh, official from government. And we're as we're figuring all of this out, we have to be prepared to know that the adversary is on our networks. And while we're remediating, we also have to be operating. And that puts us in a very challenging position. Who is best positioned to get to the bottom of this, Kirsten, and to you know out the malware, as it were, if possible? It's a great question because it's really one of the uh, emerging themes that has come from this, this event, which is the fact that the answer is the public and the private sector. So the United States government, in collaboration with industry, has to do that. They have to do this together. Uh, not, not one sector or the other can do it by itself. 
Uh, one of the things that's improved over the last few years is we see now that the private sector has actionable intelligence in cyberspace that government doesn't have, but government has the resources to bear against nation state activity. So the recovery, the response, the remediation has to be done uh, with industry government collaboration. Now, that said, President Trump hasn't really seemed to be very motivated by trying to get to the bottom of this. But is, is it possible for the country to wait until President Biden has, you know, had his inauguration and is in office? And if so, how fast will he need to work? Well, it's, it's two questions. I think certainly it's uh, the president's silence on this has been deafening. Uh, but the good news is, is that there are workers in uh, the, the Department of Homeland Security, in the National Security Agency, the defense infrastructure within government that are working tirelessly at this, as well as industry. Industry is working with government. So we're not losing time, but it will certainly help to have leadership on this issue because cybersecurity is a priority. And the Biden administration will come in knowing that it's a priority. And if there is one, uh, if there's a silver lining to all of this, it's that make no mistake that we have got to uh, put our resources together to focus on cybersecurity for ne the next year and for the future as a priority for the administration. You know, how much have we lost by now, Kirsten? How much is at risk of getting lost before this gets under control? It's, it is another great question because this, this discovery phase is broad uh, and we're still figuring out what, uh, what has been lost, but more importantly, what's the intent? So we're classifying this in some cases as espionage, but this goes far beyond espionage because we can say that you know, it's espionage right up until the point that malware on one of the networks gets activated and you know, seeks to destroy our critical infrastructure. I think that is one of the most challenging pieces of any cyber attack is you don't know the intent and it can be a long term impact. And we're still figuring all of that out. Now, what was it that determined that it was Russia? And, and now that we know, presumably that it was, what do we know about the attacker? Well, I think we're still uh, confirming specifically that it's this particular Russian foreign adversary. Uh, uh, a malicious hacker known as APT29, a group, or Cozy Bear. And typically, we do this based on the, the tactics, the techniques, and the procedures used by the adversary. What is unique about this attack, and one of the reasons why we were not able to detect it sooner, is that the tactics, the techniques, and the procedures were different than those used by this adversary before. Uh, so we're collecting intelligence. Uh, certainly, the experts who have been studying uh, this adversary for years uh, everyone seems to believe uh, that it is this this Russian or ha this Russian hacking group, and uh, I think as we look at this, it's a it's important to understand how tactics can evolve, and that we have to prepare for that which we haven't expected, and that's one of the key pieces to this event. Kirsten, is there any doubt in your mind or in any of your peers or colleagues' minds that this goes beyond just being mischief, that there is actual actionable intelligence being gathered here? I absolutely believe that it's go, it goes beyond mischief. Um, and I think that, you know, as we're hearing from cyber experts and others who are looking at this type of attack, there is a recklessness to this. There is a broad reaching impact. And at the same time, it's targeted critical infrastructure. It's targeted specific agencies within government that have a lot of power and a lot of impact. And that's why, as we look at this, you know, the speculation is that this could be one of the most significant cyber attacks on our government and our infrastructure in modern history. If those that are trying to defend the U.S. against this type of attack are vulnerable, which we've seen they are, then what do we do next, Kirsten? What's important right now is to recognize that no company, no sector can do this on its own. Government and industry have to work together before something like this happens. What we've talked about, it's a Department of Defense term called pre-event planning. It's how government and industry plan, how they can take actionable intelligence, connect the dots, of what is being seen on the networks and bring together all of the resources to determine what is happening so that we can be ahead of the adversary. We also have to do a better job defending our networks. Uh, we're, it's too easy for the adversaries to do what they're setting out to do. So as we look to the next administration, as we look to the Biden administration, there has to be an investment in our defense as well as our offense. Uh, and it's not an either or, we have to work on those together. And clearly, uh, what this has shown uh, in a stark light 
is that we have to focus on supply chain security, understand how to make our supply chains more secure, more resilient, and bake security into our structure uh, for, uh, for the supply chains. All right, Kirsten, thank you very much. Again, we'll be keeping an eye on this particular story. Kirsten Tolt is Managing Director at the Cyber Readiness Institute. Coming up, where the US and the rest of the world stand in rolling out the much anticipated COVID-19 vaccines, we'll have the latest. This is Bloomberg. The US now leads the world in COVID-19 vaccine shots administered. The CDC says more than 1 million people have been inoculated in the 10 days since the first doses were cleared for use. More than 2.6 million people in six countries have received the shots. Meantime, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson is imposing tougher regulations across a swath of England in an effort to control the mutant strain of COVID-19 that's spreading quickly across the country. Let's bring in Bloomberg's healthcare reporter now, Bob Langreth. Bob, thanks for joining. So now we have several vaccines that are on the move, as it were. Does it mean that we will be get access to these vaccines any quicker or is the timeline as was still intact? Yeah, so right now these vaccines are still in quite short supply. Uh, and in the U.S., we're vaccinating, you know, healthcare workers and nursing home residents. So nursing home residents uh, are even budget, just just got going. I think they've vaccinated people. I think as they said today, in 238 facilities in the U.S., and they're hoping to get it up to a thousand nursing homes uh, next week. So they're just starting on some of the most vulnerable categories. Now, the U.S. today just signed a, a deal with Pfizer to, to access more doses of its vaccine, but that was another 100 million doses. But those won't really be online uh, until the second quarter and not fully done until July 31st. So uh, supply is ramping up, but right now we're just at the very beginnings of a kind of very long campaign to vaccinate lots and lots of people. And getting all those short shots and a lot of arms is going to be, you know, a very difficult, a complicated distribution process. Now, this new 100 million doses adds to the previous 100 million to make 200 million, but that is actually 100 million people vaccinated. Is that going to be enough between that vaccine and whatever we can buy from Moderna to provide vaccines for anybody who wants them in the United States? Yeah, so between uh, Moderna and between Pfizer, uh, they've now ordered 200 million doses for each. So that's 400 million doses, uh, but that's a two-dose vaccine. So that's enough for 200 million people. So that's, you know, not enough for the entire U.S. population, which is, you know, around uh, 328 million people. Now, they, the vaccines haven't been fully tested in children yet, so they can't get it. But there's another vaccine uh, from Johnson & Johnson. It's a one-dose vaccine, and that's uh, as expected. That trial's moving along. It's fully enrolled. It's moving along well, and as expected, to be yeah, getting lots of cases, unfortunately, because the caseload in the U.S. is so high. So that trial is expected to yield results some point in January, perhaps as soon as early January. And that could, if it works, be on the market uh, in, you know, late January, early February, that sort of time frame. And, you know, the U.S. has ordered uh, millions upon millions of doses of that one. So if you, that one works, that could, you'd have three, and that would be enough to potentially vaccinate essentially the, essentially the whole U.S. population. So even as we get fantastic news on the vaccine front, we are still obviously seeing, you know, peak hospitalizations that we haven't seen since May and so on in, in, in the U.S. And, you know, some awful news out of Europe as well. What about other vaccines? I noticed that you worked on a story about the China COVID vaccine that we've heard about, a bit about, but it's not at all as effective as the Moderna one or the Pfizer one. Can you give us any data? Yeah, so that's uh, what's going on with that vaccine is, is really, really murky. There was, there was a big trial in Brazil. This is one of the first big rigorous trials of that vaccine on 13,000 patients uh, in Brazil. I think it was healthcare workers. And that was supposed, they were supposed to announce the results today. And as I understand it, what's ha happened is suddenly at the last moment, they said they weren't going to announce the results. All they said was they, it's, you know, say it's effective enough for emergency authorization. It's more than 50% effective. But of course, it's, that's, there's a big difference in 50% 
percent effective and the 95 percent effective we're seeing for the messenger RNA vaccines from Moderna and Pfizer. So, and they said they well, the company they had to review the results for 15 days. So it was really murky what's going on, why they're not putting out the results uh, fully, and it, it's just not clear what's going on. If the results, you know, are okay but not that great, it, it's simply not clear what's happening with that vaccine. It's very strange. All right, Bob, thank you so much for joining us and for keeping us up to date on all of this news. Bloomberg's Robert Langreth there. Well, as we've been covering, one of the key public officials who've been vaccinated for COVID-19 is Dr. Anthony Fauci of the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Diseases. He spoke earlier with Bloomberg's David Weston about receiving the first dose of the Moderna vaccine himself and how he expects most Americans to get inoculated by the end of the summer 2021. Have a listen. For at least five or six hours after the injection, I didn't feel anything at all. I mean, less so than a flu vaccine. Then a late afternoon, early evening, I started to get a little bit of an ache, really nothing to distract me or bother me, but just something that when I press on it, you could actually feel it. Had a good night's sleep last night. I didn't get you know, a, a lot of muscle aches or anything. I mean, I felt something a little different, like there was something going on like maybe a little warm, a little flushed. Woke up this morning, I feel perfectly fine. The only thing I have now is that my where the injection site is still is a little sore. But when I say sore, I mean really not very distractingly sore, just baseline, borderline. If there are side effects, how quickly would they kick in? They usually all occur within the first 12 hours and they last between 24 and at the most 36 hours. It's extremely unusual for someone to have something beyond 36 to 48 hours. Now, you, you said in getting your inoculation, it was for two reasons. First of all, you are a physician. You were actually treating patients. But secondly, you wanted it to really represent to people that this truly is safe. We don't need to be worried about it. Do you have a sense that there is much resistance at this point in the vaccination program? You know, it's getting better, thank goodness. When we did surveys, you know, a month or so to ago, you know, there was almost 50% of the people had some reservations or skepticism about getting vaccinated. The last survey, which was just last week, they said that more than 65% of the people said that they would be willing to get the vaccine. We really want to get that up even much higher than that, because the projection is that if you get anywhere between 70 and 85% of the population vaccinated, you would create a, a, an umbrella of immunity over the community, which could really get the level of virus so low that it would not be a threat. And th then you could answer the question that everyone seems to be asking appropriately, is that when can we start approaching some degree of normality? Uh, when can we be doing things like safely having the children in school or going to a restaurant and sitting indoors or going to a movie theater. You know, I would think if we start getting the general population vaccinated, let's say mid-April, between now and then, we're going through the various priorities. We started off healthcare providers and people in nursing homes and long-term facilities. The second level is people over 75 and individuals in uh, what's called necessary or, or, or important places in society to keep society running. And that could be anything from a police officer to a fireman to someone who runs a grocery store so people can get food. When you get through those priorities and you get to what I call open season, like anybody can get the vaccination, even though you're not in a priority group, I imagine that's probably going to be sometime in April and then if we can really get vaccines going in April, May, June, July, and August, by the time we get to the end of the summer, I think we can get to that goal that I'm talking about, about getting the overwhelming majority of the population vaccinated. And that was Dr. Anthony Fauci, director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Still ahead, we'll take a closer look at the disastrous launch of video game Cyberpunk 2077 which was supposed to be this year's biggest title release. That and gaming trends in general for 2021 next. This is Bloomberg.
futuristic role-playing game Cyberpunk 2077 suffered a massive backlash since its hotly anticipated debut in December. Initially expected to become one of the best-selling games of all time, Cyberpunk is plagued by bugs that reviewers and gamers say make the game nearly unplayable on previous generation consoles. Sony has pulled the title from the PlayStation Store and now offers full refunds along with Microsoft. Cyberpunk developers at the Polish publisher CD Projekt have criticized the company over unrealistic deadlines in the months leading up to its release. Now, for more on Cyberpunk and what lies ahead in 2021 for the gaming industry, we're joined by Leila Shabir, co-founder and CEO of Girls Make Games. It's a series of summer camps, workshops and game jams designed to inspire the next generation of creators. And Leila, I mean, it must be exceedingly disappointing when a game so anticipated as Cyberpunk 2077 comes out and it just isn't up to par. We're not just talking about a couple of bugs, we're talking about really just unplayable games. How much damage does that do to a company when something like that happens? I think I uh, honestly can't comment on the damage to the company, but I can definitely talk about, you know, how increasingly complex development cycles have become. You know, there was a time when a $20 million budget was considered a massive game and video games have now exceeded $100 million budgets over and over uh, with thousands of people working on them for years and months at a time. Like this title was initially announced several years ago. So it's that the anticipation has been building over time. And unfortunately, like the game was definitely not ready to to be launched and it was definitely not ready for um, the player's experience. It's definitely evident in the response, but that is the reality of the game development world that we live in right now. It's a, it's unlike any other entertainment uh, form that we see. It's not like a movie, it's not like a TV show where the consumer doesn't interact with the medium. Whereas with video games, there's thousands of ways a player can interact. And given the number of the variety of you know, gamers that are out there, the variety of play styles that people have, the game can be interacted within a hundred million ways. Um, so I think it's just one of those realities of the industry that we live in. And I think it's definitely a good lesson for everyone to take. As an educator, it's definitely something that I talk to my kids about all the time. Um, you know, you have to yes. understand how complex it is to make a game. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, this whole industry has grown so much now. It's overtaking so many of the other entertainment industries. And it's not just the games themselves. It's also people watching people play. And obviously, you know, we're, we're seeing both men, women, boys, girls, you know, everybody gets involved in this. But there are questions around the representation of women and, you know, things like inclusivity for all uh, in games. How are you taking that on with, with girls who show an interest in this kind of, uh, you know, environment and who may possibly want to be developers? Absolutely. I think that's a topic that's very, very close to my heart. And that's exactly why we started Girls Make Games. Over 50% or nearly 50% of the gamers out there are actually women, but less than 20% of them actually get to make video games. So the representation gap is massive. And when it comes down to any kind of media or any art form like video games, for example, the developers or the creator of the art um, basically is, is the voice of the art. And in this case, if it's men making games, they are going to show more men in the video games. And I think one of the biggest barriers that we have to overcome is kind of introduce young women to careers in gaming and show them that this is a possibility that they could pursue as they grow up. And as more women become developers, we'll start to see more diverse characters. We'll start to see more representatives of you know the actual gaming consumer population in the games themselves so it's it's not a good place just yet i would like to say that girls made games should go extinct over time because we wouldn't need to do this anymore but we're not there yet right and i mean you know scandal after scandal happens in the arena and you know just it's just taking a long time and you know mm -hmm. it, it, after girls there are so many mo more causes to to get right in this sphere right everybody should be able to have fun playing yeah. and developing games and, and you know being the CEO of gaming companies. What's the interest in, in girls that come through your camps in being more than you know, a spectator or a player? Oh, a massive interest. I mean, the girls that come in, they're just drawn to everything that 
uh, you know, goes into a video game from the storytelling to characters that are rich and, and environments that are creative and unique. Uh, one of the best things about video games is that you get to write your own story and you get to live a story uh, that you create as opposed to just watch it. And watching other people play your game and interact with it and explore it is just really magical. So one of the biggest things that we see at camp um, is that it's not necessarily the coding that gets the girls in, but it's it's really the design and the narrative part of game development that's exciting to them. And the technology, yes. the coding is just kind of the, um, the tool that brings it together. And Leila, I have to ask you, just on a separate note, what are the games that you are looking forward to next year? Uh, well, I'm definitely looking forward to Halo. <laughs> I've been a big Halo fan for some time. It's coming out next year. Um, it's always really great games, both on the PlayStation, Nintendo, um, and different consoles. But I've primarily been a League of Legends player, so it's one of those things where I really look forward to the annual competition every year. So uh, the championships next year would be pretty exciting. All right. Well, we will follow your... Uh your success or otherwise <laughs> in all of those games. Leila, thank you very much and uh, good luck with Girls Make Games. Leila Shabir is CEO of Girls Make Games. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Bloomberg Daybreak Asia is next. Do stay tuned. This is Bloomberg.